that is online. Okay. I'm going to just dab chair again. Hello and welcome to the uh, October 3rd City Council mem meeting. I'd like to call this meeting to order. May we have a roll call, please? Council Member Bauer? Here. Council Member Arroyo? Here. Council Member Moulton? Here. Council Member Castellano? Here. And Mayor Pro Tem Burgell? Here. Thank you. And with that, if you'd all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And could we have a report out of closed session, please? Yes. In closed session tonight, uh, on a first by Council Member Arroyo, seconded by Council Member Bergell, the council voted unanimously to authorize initiation of litigation on three cases. Uh, the details of those cases will be released at a later date as appropriate and in compliance with the government code. Great, thank you. Okay, um, first of all, I'd like to announce under mayor's announcements that item H, which is the sewer lateral, lateral ordinance, has been pulled from the agenda and it will not be discussed tonight, at tonight's meeting. It'll be deferred. Um, secondly, I'd like to turn it over to our count, uh, city manager Slattery to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Bergell, and good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Bergell and Council. Um, so our first presentation today is from our new managing mental health clinician. Um, Jacob Rosen uh, was hired approximately a month and a half ago. Um, I first want to thank um, uh, Sergeant LaFrance and Project Manager Davis about all their work that they've done um, prior to the hiring of the, management, uh, the Managing Mental Health Condition. They started working on an alternative response program for uh, mental health calls. Um, since then, we've hired Jacob, and he's been working diligently with our city attorney and our other staff to develop policies and procedures to implement uh, a full-blown um, alternative response program. And so um, I'm really happy to say that he's been an outstanding fit um, for the city, um, has been um, very knowledgeable in this field, and he comes with a great background. And so I, I want to welcome... Jacob Rosen, excuse me, Managing Mental Health Clinician Rosen, to come and talk about um, the implementation of our alternative response team. Thank you, Miles. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Burgell and Council. Um, I, my name is Jacob Rosen. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist and am happy to fill the position of Managing Mental Health Clinician with the city. Um, I think this is a really exciting opportunity and I'm happy to talk with everyone about it today. Uh, so. To start, we are uh, building the program Crisis Alternative Response of Eureka, and the goal will be to provide, not sounds, uh, <laughs> services to Eureka. And so talking about that tonight, I thought that we'd at least go through a brief overview, what, why, how, where, and who. Uh, to start, what is a crisis response team? For Typical teams, it's going to be a combination of mental health intervention and crisis prevention. And so instead of the police department having to manage these things on their own, we have people who can go out. We also have individuals, case managers and clinicians who can then come back on the back end after helping folks and provide case management, connection to services, system navigation. And so the team should be split, hopefully, ideally, in about two. I mean, our, our, our goal is to work until there aren't crises, but there are going to be crises that are unforeseeable, and so we're going to then manage those as they come up. Um, but hopefully we're able to provide enough crisis intervention and prevention efforts um, up front to be able to kind of see some of those from, from getting too bad. So kind of the, the bread and butter will be that field crisis intervention. Um, 
going out into the field, law enforcement gets a call. There's a behavioral health crisis. Um, someone who maybe is speaking nonsensically, they're having a psychotic episode. Our team will then be activated and co-respond with law enforcement uh, to be able to go out into the field, assist in supporting that person and assist law enforcement in helping resolve that situation safely and in a way that's more clinically informed for that person's care. Um, and kind of providing that extra layer of expertise when the stakes are, are much higher. Sometimes these situations are unsafe. Um, sometimes these situations are, are needing a level of de-escalation that law enforcement hasn't been provided in academy or the extra training that they've received in, in the department. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more about how things led up to that point in just a minute. The other half of what we'll be providing is that short-term case management and system navigation. So the system navigation piece, you know, with, with our services all over the place, some folks don't have the capacity to be able to navigate from one organization to the next. You know, if someone shows up to mental health and mental health says, well, you need to go talk to social security, that person may not have the functioning capabilities to be able to then go over to social security and start navigating that process. And so one of our goals will be to then be able to assist with that. So one example of a crisis intervention may look something along these lines. There's a crisis that occurs, someone's out in the community, and they, they are having some sort of behavioral health crisis, whether that's related to mental health, whether that's related to substance use. Um, it comes to the attention of law enforcement or someone calls it in. Our team responds, we provide de-escalation, we provide some kind of quick therapy, uh, therapeutic conversation, making sure that they're able to feel supported, making sure that they're validated, but also making sure that we can kind of bring things down and then problem solve what's going on so that we can figure out how to help next. Once that individual is able to de-escalate, we can then make sure that we coordinate follow up with that individual. Uh, we're gonna aim for within five days of a crisis intervention, and we can loop back around and work with them to make sure that they, they're getting the ongoing services that they need to be able to then be successful and not re-enter a crisis state. There it goes. A crisis prevention uh, example may be that a community organization or community partner identifies a individual who's maybe on the verge of entering crisis but isn't quite there yet. Um, in this situation, that community partner may be able to contact us, make that referral. We can then respond to that individual and through system navigation and case management, we can work with them to be able to help connect them to the services that they need to be connected to for ongoing care, while also working with them in kind of a therapeutic manner to make sure that they don't enter that crisis stage. Oh, there we go. Is that right? Yeah. So one of the ways that we're going to be able to do this is to, to provide that, that easy access, is making sure that we have minimal barriers to getting our services. One of the ways to do that is to kind of skip out on the insurance piece. One of the problems with insurance is that it requires you to have a qualifying diagnosis to receive a service and have that service reimbursed. And as much as that's the system that we work in, when you're providing emergency care and you're providing kind of things, services to, to individuals who have the least amount of resources available, making sure that there are minimal barriers to access, accessing that is important, which requires us to be able to then identify goals quickly that may not necessarily have a medical necessity under that insurance company, and then be able to provide those services so that we can help people who may not necessarily meet the neat boxes that the, the insurance companies have aligned for what they'll pay for. Um, it's also going to allow us to, to assist our community partners who are constrained by those insurance companies, right? So behavioral health has medical necessities. A lot of these other agencies have medical necessities that are required to, in order to provide case management services, in order to provide intervention services. And when we don't, when we are not constrained by that, that will allow those agencies to also tap us to be able to assist those clients. And again, stopping them from falling through the cracks. So our current phases of development, um, there, there wasn't any structure, <laughs> right? The, this is the city's first kind of foray into the helping profession and provide in, in terms of providing like a medical level service. Um, and so there's been a lot of structural building. Um, there's, you know, no medical record system. So we've been working on securing a medical record system. Um, we haven't had any policy and procedure around HIPAA and managing pro clients' privacy. And so we've been uh, diligently collaborating and working extensively with Autumn to, to arrange 
what those policies are going to look like and get some consultation around how we can implement that effectively. Um, and then the other thing is staffing. Uh, the positions that we needed were not developed. We've since developed those, and uh, you all were gracious enough to, to pass those positions into to the city's library of classifications uh, a couple sessions ago. Um, and so with that, we, we are steadily making progress moving forward. Um, our next phase is going to be working on you know budgeting and determining where funding is going to come from, and then we'll be able to start hiring and roll out the program. There it goes. Oh, we skipped it. Oh, no, we didn't. So why do we need to provide these services? Mental health has needed to be mobile for a long time now. Um, there's been a, a strong demand for resolving these crises in the field. And uh, especially in rural communities, it's been difficult to implement just because of shortages in profession, professionals, um, shortages in funding, and, and that sort of thing. And fortunately, right now, California is really doubling down on, on pushing for these sorts of uh, teams to be put in place. Um, but it's been a, a long time coming. And you know, part of this really started back in the 60s um, and 70s when kind of California's mental health system was decentralized. Um, we started to close down a lot of our institutions. We started to uh, kind of unravel an architecture of systems that allowed for these folks to, to have care. It was not a perfect system by any means, but what ended up happening is we didn't get the other piece of it. So the goal was to decentralize mental health, take it out of these institutions, bring it back to the community. But then there really was never a strong implementation that could keep up with the, the needs of the mental health field built into the communities. And so what ended up happening is a lot of folks became homeless and law enforcement was required to step in and take over the responsibility for a lot of these first contacts. And so, one of our primary goals is to kind of take some of that responsibility back from law enforcement. Law enforcement has been working really hard and diligently at this. And at the same time, this training, I mean, you know, being, being able to, to resolve things on a clinician level is not something that is trained for, for your standard officer on the streets. And so being able to take some of this responsibility and obligation back as a profession, I think is really important. There we go. So how are we going to work? We're going to go for realistic interventions, right? When someone's in crisis, we don't necessarily want to do something that's convoluted. We don't want to do something that's going to be really complex or difficult to execute. We want to work with the client where they're at and, and help resolve what we can in that moment. We're going to lean into uh, the initial intention of that decentralization of institutions and go for community-based interventions and kind of helping build people into the community a little bit more. Uh, we're going to work to support people in navigating this decentralized system, whether it's making it to social service agencies or to mental health or to some of the, the uh, homeless resources in the area that are not in the same area. And then we're going to continue to work on developing creative programs to, to fill some of the other gaps that are missing right now. The other part about how we're going to work is we're going to work for grant funding. Um, to start off, we want to make sure that we are working diligently and securing funding. There's a lot of grant funding out there. Um, here are a couple of examples. Uh, Measure Z, uh, the HAP uh, money that's going to be coming to Humboldt County. Uh, BCHIP is uh, uh, grant funding, block grant funding at the state level that is providing for structure. Um, the next round will be specifically for uh, infrastructure and crisis continuum services. Um, partnership is going to be sending money out to various counties, and there are other lines of funding that may be accessible. And then the model that we want to follow is similar to CAPE. Um, CAPE has been quite successful, starting with grant funding, slowly working and improving and showing its efficacy, and then eventually transitioning to having some city funding, um, complementing the grant funding that they continue to work for. Where will CARE operate? within the city limits. Oh. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Well, we missed the slide with city limits, but within the city limits, with a couple of exceptions. Um, part of those exceptions, uh, I will continue to fulfill my role on the crisis negotiations team. Um, other clinicians who come in may have that opportunity as well. That's a collaboration with the sheriff's department. So when there's 
remarkable crises in the community, maybe that SWAT is being called out to, we will collaborate with them and again, lend that mental health specialty with them. Um, that may bring us outside of the community. Uh, and then the other component will be if we're connecting uh, clients with resources that are maybe in Arcata or maybe in Fortuna. Um, working with Arcata Housing Partnership, maybe they have a you know facility up in uh, Arcata that has housing space for a client that we're working with, that may be something that we bring them to um, and help them transition to that area. But otherwise, for our crisis response, that will mostly be um, in city limits with the exception of the CNT stuff. Who's going to be in the program? Clinicians and case managers. Um, I want to go for uh, emphasis on the case managers. The, they're the folks who kind of make these programs work. They carry the bulk of the weight. Um, so the, a daily team will consist of a clinician and two case managers. Um, this will allow for a clinician and case manager to respond to crises in the community, and then a case manager to be doing some of that follow-up work where they're working with folks that we've already contacted or that the community's referred to us. Um, in all, uh, we want to cover seven days a week, and so with a team of one clinician, two case managers daily, um, that'll make for four case managers and two clinicians. That overlap day can be used uh, for extra outreach or for team meetings or extra projects, that sort of thing. Who are the clients gonna be? The citizens of Eureka and anyone else who happens to be coming through. Um, we really wanna stay community-based. We wanna make sure that we're out there, we're doing outreach, even if we don't necessarily have a crisis to respond to, we're making sure that we're helping folks as we can. Um, individuals who are experiencing homelessness, individuals with mental health issues, substance use issues, um, anyone who's having some sort of behavioral health crisis or severe emotional disturbance will be responding to and assisting. But that's actually not questions yet. <laughs> <laughs> because that may be care, but we're also working on another project and that's gonna be a community health town hall. Um, what we'd like to put together is an educational session to be able to provide the public access to ask questions um, and get resources and get knowledge around mental health and homelessness and substance use. Um, and so we'll be developing that. <laughs> there we go. Um, our goal is to have theme topics. Um, currently, we're talking about uh, providing a session every quarter. Um, and then we'll have a panel of experts. There will be time for the public to have questions and answers, um, to ask questions and get answers. And it'll be an opportunity for outreach and networking, allowing agencies to be able to reach out to the public and table and also reach out to each other. Um, you know, in, in working in the area now for a little over six years, um, I've noticed there's a lot of, of passionate frustration. And I think that's something that's nationwide. And hopefully we can, find a way to come together as a community to build on that and then really push forward and having some some community solutions to to a problem that is in our community and that we all need to, to work toward and attend to. And so with that, oh, and schedule will come out on that as we develop it. So schedule coming soon. Now we can do questions. Mm -hmm. So be, before we take questions, I just know that it's probably eating one of our council members care is the name that we came up for this program and it's crisis alternative response for eureka and so that's where the care um, acronym came from but thank you Man managing mental health condition rosen thank you miles thank you questions from council uh, council member molton yes thank you uh mr rosen that was very informative and he said he said what it stood for first oh yeah. <laughs> I always appreciate uh, accessibility of information. Acronyms build walls. Um, Very so, <laughs> uh, so I had a question about doing about some of the outreach work, looking at folks who are not necessarily in crisis but might be chronically having trouble. Um, I think we all can picture one or two people that we know of that we might see daily around. Can you describe some of um, how you might engage those folks? Yeah, that will be the, the system navigation component. And so, you know, if we look at, again, the kind of the, how our services are decentralized, we have free mail on the mission over at one spot. We have social services over another. We have social security over at another spot. We have the DMV to get an ID over at another location. We have mental health all the way across town at another location. And so some of those folks who, who are chronically 
out on the streets having difficulties. Maybe they're not escalating to a crisis degree, but they need that outreach. We will hopefully be able to assign a case manager to them who can follow up with them more frequently and then help connect them to those resources so that we can kind of get all of the things in order that they need to either get housing, to get some sort of mental health services or get some sort of substance use treatment. And so these folks will be going out to meet people where they are? Yes. Yep. Out in the community, really, again, focusing on that community based intervention, um, heading out and finding them in, in, in their element. Um, there will be a lot of collaborating with Uplift and, and their really heroic outreach workers um, and making sure that, that we're, we're you know, trying to connect as many people as we can to the services that are in the community. That was my next. I was just going to ask about uh, who you might be collaborating with on outreach, Uplift, the Raven Project, uh, some other folks that know where people are and where they're staying out. Uh, very, very much rough. so. Lovely. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So I have a question then. So you were saying seven days a week. It's mm -hmm. awesome. And thank you for your presentation. But not only thank you for the presentation, thank you for like being out there and being willing to do this work. It's such important work. And it's just such important work. And, you know, we hear a lot of complaints about people in our community, whether they, you know, have an addiction problem or whatever their problem might be. Um, and, and having this opportunity for them is just such a gift for our community. So, again, thank you. But when we're talking about seven days a week, um, what's that look like after five? Uh, so our, our goal will be to structure our time of day that we are operating uh, according to when 911 is getting the most calls for behavioral health issues. And so there, there is data already existing on this. I don't recall the times offhand. Um, I want to say it's somewhere around 11 calls for behavioral health start to peak, 11 in the morning. And then that goes until around 9 or 10 o'clock at night, if okay. I'm remembering right. And so we will want to structure our time to catch that the, the bulk of that time. Um, I don't know that I mean, as much as I would like a 24-hour service and, and other agencies around the country and other models of this implementation are 24 hours, I don't know that we would successfully find the number of staff members that we would need to operate 24-7. Um, and so I think that, that that would be a huge barrier. Um, I'm, I'm not adverse to that. If we you know, are operating and we find this is really tremendously successful and then all of a sudden there's staff to, to, and funding to hire um, for that, that full-time 24-7 support, I think that'd be wonderful. Um, but right now we want to really kind of take, take what we can get and then focus it on, on the bulk of, of the calls that, that come in. Well, just yeah. the idea that you have are people that are going to be working after five, I think is critical because I know that people have reached out trying to find solutions for people after five and it's, you know, without calling the police, it's very challenging to find those solutions. So thank you for that. Uh, I just wanted to add that, um, Obviously, this is in its infancy, and we're starting to work on all of the program components, and um, I think we'll be very successful, as um, Jacob alluded to, in getting grant funding, but it will be <clears throat> need to be a phased approach, and if we're looking at issues of being on call and those type of things, depending on the priority level and where it's at, that's something that we can look at as well, is having um, individuals on call. I know that Jacob currently, for the... Um, crisis team currently is on call <clears throat> and he'll maintain that but as far as our other staff that come in there'll be an opportunity potentially to have them on call if the situation warrants that um, but I do want to make it clear that right now we do have some funding in place that would be applicable for some of these um, case managers and we'll get them hired as soon as we possibly can and then we'll be looking at you know the success of our CAPE program and getting more grant funding to fill the other positions. Well, I just also want to say, and then I'll, then I got you, Scott. Um, you know, I just really appreciate our city and the innovation that we are working on in this population because, you know, this isn't something that a lot of cities do. Um, you know, a lot of people count on the county as far as mental health and those kinds of things. And as we've seen, it's just not enough. And so I really appreciate our city looking at ways to build people up instead of, you know, constantly just having to marginalize them and put them down. So again, thank you. Uh, Council Member Bauer. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Jacob, can tell you how excited I am that uh, uh, you're here and this program is happening. And I think the community health town halls will be really good. I mean, so many um, calls I get, emails from from community members, you know, are are about this issue about mental health. So I think 
educating our community is going to be really um, important. I have one question about um, this program's interaction, you know, it seemed with with the emergency room with St. Joe's, uh, St. Joseph's. How do you see that kind of playing out? You know, somebody ends up um, in the ER, just the way it's been working. What do you see as a process for the interaction of care with our, our local hospital? So I, I uh, am hoping to work with St. Joseph's ER really closely. Um, I, I have quite a few contacts over there. Uh, part of my previous position was as a mobile response team clinician um, assessing 5150 holds in the ER. And so I'm very acquainted with their BART team um, and and many of their nursing staff. I, I think that the the current situation is is complex and difficult in many respects. And I hope that our team, especially with that, that kind of low, low barrier access to services component, um, we may be able to assist in getting into the ER and support some of those folks. Um, we may also be able to assist the emergency room in, in when some of those folks are being discharged and there isn't necessarily a, a mental health staff member that is able to assist again, primarily because they're not open to services or they, aren't meeting the criteria for case management services um, that we're able to then provide that support as they leave the ER um, and and really kind of streamline the, the folks who are going in, streamline the folks who are coming out. And then if they need behavioral health assistance while folks are in the ER too, I'm also not adverse to, to going in and, and having staff provide that support inside the ER. Um, though I do know St. Joe's is working on hiring their own behavioral health team um, to, to help with some of the de-escalation that's in, in, in the hospital. And I'll just add to that, too. I, I think it was very key when working this out with Jacob and having a, a really good understanding of the preventative component of this. Um, the 50 percent of the time spent being preventative, I would hope, would alleviate a lot of those um, emergency situations to where we don't have to get St. Joe's involved in the first place. Great. Council Member Arroyo. Sorry. Council Member Arroyo. Thank you. Great um, presentation. I'm so excited to finally get this off the ground. Um, I wondered about the um, ideas you have so far, you and EPD, around the crisis dispatch. I know that's something that um, I have concerns about. Um, you know, the initial vision was that it could both take some of the pressure off EPD and um, de-escalate to send clinicians out perhaps without um, sworn armed officers. So I wonder what, how, have you come up with any protocols or is that still kind of to be determined as far as the dispatch component? And maybe that's a question for the chief too. <laughs> so we, we haven't nailed down exact protocols yet. Um, that's still something that's very much in the mix and, and something that, you know, we will need to really continue to collaborate on as this evolves um, to figure out what's going to work best for our community. Um, there are many different models around the, the, the country. Some places have their own crisis line. People call into the crisis line. That's where the referral comes from. And the team dispatches from the crisis line. Um, there are also models where law enforcement will engage the behavioral health team um, to do co-response. There are also models where maybe dispatch engages the behavioral health team and then they come out and respond independently of a law enforcement officer. Um, I, from our conversations, we've really talked about doing kind of a hybrid um, where a lot of times we're doing a co-response with the CSET uh, division, but at other times, especially if it's a client that we know or we know the situation is safe, um, then we can dispatch our team members out there independently without law enforcement and relieve them from that. Um, one of our, our primary goals especially will be to relieve patrol um, of situations that they come across because I know that EPD is so remarkably short-staffed right now. Um, being able to lend assistance to their patrol team especially is going to be important, allowing them to get back to doing their, their job. And then we can kind of, again, take back some of that, that ownership and, and obligation of providing mental health services in the community um, on our end. Thank you so much. Uh, council Member Castellano. Thanks. And yeah, similar to other council members, thank you for stepping into this role. And I'm, I'm very excited for it. Um, I imagine, you know, I mean, the city has limited resources for this, as we've discussed, and the county has certainly greater resources. You know, and so I'm imagining kind of overlap. Have you been working with the county to create kind of protocol and systems for like how they can also kind of work as partners potentially with, with some of these 
challenges. Yeah, so so I've had um, contacts with the supervising clinician for the mobile response team and the supervising clinician for Semper Virens. Um, I meet with them regularly, um, both work related and not work related. Um, and and we've certainly discussed how to streamline kind of the emergency services component to this. Um, I, I think a real strength of, of what CARE will be able to provide where the county won't is, again, the folks who maybe are, are either not already connected to services or maybe don't quite meet criteria for services. Um, there are a, 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 There is a population of individuals who maybe escalate to a crisis, but don't necessarily require ongoing level one care at the county level. Um, and so they get referred out to the community. And a lot of times though, they're kind of in this gray area where they're not meeting county criteria, but they aren't really gonna get connected on their own. And so that'll be kind of a, a, a niche that we can fill. Um, and then also just uh, continuing to collaborate. If they have staff to go and attend to something, great, then we can work with them on that. Um, the the big component, I think, will be that it will relieve the little staff that they have to be able to work with the rest of the county that they're responsible for, because we'll have a, a team specific to the city here. Great, and then I think just a follow up, I was thinking, and spe specifically in terms of Semper Virens, you know, something I hear a lot is, there's not enough beds or it's difficult to for people to get in there even though maybe they need to be there or you know there's pr that perception um will advocacy kind of be part of your role um in terms of our relationship with the state or or um you know or, or kind of advocating for potentially more beds at some providers or anything like that absolutely um i i <laughs> As a marriage and family therapist, part of our ethics code actually requires us to engage in advocacy um, and try and better the system, and, and that's something I'm very passionate about. Um, I'd like to work with the mental health board, with the the county administration for behavioral health, um, and our, our other community partners to really come together and collaborate to develop institutions and facilities and programs that are going to kind of better the entire county. Um, you know, Eureka ends up being kind of the hub of a lot of these services. And so I think that as a city, we have a lot of, of uh, room at the table that we need to fill um, in doing that advocacy. And, and I think that the more that we can engage in that collaboration will be uh, the, the better. Um, as far as kind of like ground game stuff and, you know, helping with, with the, the really systemic issues that Semper Viren struggles with, um, you know, they have a, a really short staff that does really heroic work with what they have. Um, but it's, you know, the, the, the struggles that they are facing are very much the same as every other inpatient psychiatric unit in the state, which is not enough nurses, not enough clinicians, um, and not enough beds. And, you know, it, it's difficult because I think it feels so emergent here, but there, there, there very much is this crisis ever in every other county that has an inpatient unit as well. Um, and so, you know, figuring out how we can support them in streamlining um, the entrance process, also helping them streamline the exit process. A lot of the times that they are uh, full, full on beds is because maybe they can't get a good enough discharge plan for an individual to come out of the hospital. If we can play a role in assisting with that, us helping that individual may not only help that individual get better services, but it may free up a bed so that they can bring someone else who's really in need over to the facility. Any further questions? No? Thank you so much. We appreciate you being here and look forward to hearing more about what you're up Thank to. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and our next presentation um, by City Manager Slattery will be about our participa participatory budget. I can assure you I will make the same mistake as a part of this presentation. So as Mayor Pro Tem uh, Regal uh, alluded to, this is a presentation about our participatory budget process. It was brought up through our budget process um, this year. Um, council approved the allocation of $75,000 to be dedicated towards a participatory budget God, I did it right twice, I'm impressed, um, process. And so staff um, formed a committee that consisted of myself, um, director, uh, finance director Millar, um, council member Arroyo, council member Castellano, as well as um, Roger um, James and Mary Jalinas um, as consultants with us. So we've had multiple meetings and we've established a, a process that we're going to go through to um, implement participatory budgeting for this fiscal year. Um, Pam, I think you're going to 
Oh, no. Okay. So, how does it work? Are you doing that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you just want me to keep doing <laughs> So, we <laughs> So, we wanted to make sure this was a collaborative process. Um, and so, um, with the discussions that we had, we, we, we figured out a program that we felt would be um, not only involve as much community members and community input as possible and, and represent the diverse diversity of, of the community, but also represent each of the wards. And so what we decided to do was um, basically um, solicit participation. Oh, you can go back. Oh. Okay, well, they are gone. So um, what we decided to do is basically um, Solicit participation of 50 community members um, within the city. Um, we'd split those community members into f the five different wards. And so in each ward, there'll be 10 community members representing each ward. And within that ward, she's going to get to this part. Backwards. Keep going. It's a third slide. Keep going. Keep going. One more, perfect. Um, so um, each of the wards will have uh, 10 community members. Um, when we have the meetings, what we'll do is we'll break them up into wards. Each of the uh, council members will sit in on the discussions with their participants, and I'll, as well as a staff member to help guide the process, and that staff member will have an understanding of all of the departments and what each of the departments do. Um, and kind of guide them through there and help them brainstorm ideas. And in each of the wards, because of the five wards, they'll be allocated $15,000 budget to each of the wards. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. And so this, as far as the time commitment for these participants, you go to the next slide. Um, we're going to do this as a part of three meetings. Um, the first meeting will be held on October 25th. Um, the first two meetings will be held via Zoom because of basically the um, makeup of this group. We want to break out into, um, into breakout sessions, and doing that in one room could prove to be pretty difficult. So the first two meetings will, will be via Zoom. The first one will be on the 25th. Um, basically, staff will come to that meeting, um, present on what the council's adopted strategic goals are for this fiscal year, and discuss how our budgeting process works. We'll also discuss in each of the departments what their roles and responsibilities are, and we'll give them an orientation on the participatory budgeting process. Um, then we'll also, which I'll go over later, discuss the criteria for the project ideas. In the second meeting, um, it will also be via Zoom, and that's where they'll break out into those five groups, um, develop project ideas with the help from staff and council, and establish one or two um, priority projects that they want to work on. And then at the December 15th meeting, this will be in person. We'll invite all of the 50 participants in the process, but also invite the general public. Um, there will be pizza provided, and so we can get as much participation as possible. It'll be held at the Warfinger, and they'll allow those participants, the, the non-participants, but members of the public that show up to also vote on um, the different prioritized projects that were come up with. You know, the next slide. Um, and then as far as the criteria for the project um, proposals, um, it must be within the, the budgetary constraints of each of the five awards. If when we get to the point of the second meeting and there's a discussion of the different um, projects and a couple of awards say, hey, I really like your idea, there's an opportunity for those wards to combine and go to $30,000 and contribute to that project that's agreed upon. Um, the projects need to fit into one of two categories, um, either a capital project that either rehabilitates a public facility or an amenity or, 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 or establish or builds and creates one. Um, the other category would be a new program or an addition to an existing program. This can include, uh, for instance, um, our, our mural projects or, you know, even Friday night markets or another event that's just newly established and can be modified. Um, all of these projects must be implemented by July of 2023, which will be the end of our fiscal year. Um, ideally, but not a requirement, we'd like for the ideas to correlate with the strategic goals that were adopted by council. 
Um, it, it can benefit the neighborhood, your ward, or the entire city. Um, the project doesn't necessarily, if it's a capital project, need to happen within your ward. Um, it must obviously fit within existing laws and ordinances, and we want it to be consistent with the city's mission, vision, and values. Um, next slide, please. And then just for miscellaneous, the next step in the process is staff has um, put together a guideline. In that guideline, it incorporates a lot of the information that I discussed tonight and also has an expression of interest form. Um, I planned on having those printed out today, but we had a, um, an issue with our printer. But I will have a bunch of hard copies printed out, make them available. We'll send out a press release um, uh, announcing this process and also um, uh, put all of this information on our social media and our website. Um, we did decide that all of the participants that, that participate are eligible for a $100 stipend. Um, in order to get that stipend, they must you know, participate in all the meetings and also be a part of the December 15th selection process. Um, once the interest forms are put in, the interest forms will be due by October 15th. And once they're turned in, those will go to a centralized email system. They'll be forwarded to each of the council members for selection. And then when they're made, we'll announce um, to those people who are selected um, and the wards. I mean, the participants will be selected by those council members. Um, other than that, that's pretty much the entirety of the project. We'll get that out tomorrow with the press release and the guidelines to go out to everybody to, to come and participate. And staff really looks forward to implementing this project and getting it um, out there to the public, and hopefully we can get the participation level that we're looking for. Any questions? Are there any questions? Council Member Moulton? Um, I was just curious about, curious about criteria for participants in participatory budgeting. So we didn't, I don't know, and this may be a question for City Attorney Luna. Um, I don't know if we need to have requirements of being an adult. Would you say we need to have a requirement for being an, being an adult? We never really discuss this. That's a great question. Acting like an adult? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Um, this question of criteria is coming to me for the first time, so I could look into it, but I think when talking about participatory budgeting, we want to keep it as broad as possible, invite as many people as possible, but, uh, whether they need to be over 18 okay, just is a good question. Just think about people like in my ward, they don't have to work in government, they don't have to oh, no. have a degree, they don't have to necessarily have any experience like this. We're just looking for folks in the community to help decide um, how a, a bit of the money gets spent through the city. Yeah, a part of the guidelines is to live or work in the city of Eureka limits. Live or work. Yeah. Okay. Councilmember Arroyo. It's not a question, it's sort of to that question. Um, but since I was part of the committee developing this, I think it's okay for me to say that um, the um, interest form is really brief um, and ask people to, uh, the question of whether they can be under 18 is a great one and I'd love to know that because it'd be great to get teens involved as well, um, if we can. But um, essentially people were just asked to say in their own words, like why why they're interested and, and what unique perspective they bring. And, and I anticipate, you know, we'll all be selecting folks from our wards to participate. And I know I personally will be looking for um, lots of people who are different from one another and who maybe haven't been involved in civic processes as much, but want to be more involved. So um, yeah, I, I guess we all get to use our own kind of lens for that. But um, it, we, we made the form really simple. Okay, any further questions? Comments, concerns? Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you, thank you Council thank you. Member Arroyo and Castellano, for all your work on this. Appreciated. Um, and secondly, I just realized that I forgot to read something. So let me go ahead and do that. Um, I think this is an important piece, and it is the first meeting of the month. The land that rests, or that Eureka rests on, is known in the Wiat language as Jirauji. Kind of. <laughs> Um, past actions by local, state, and federal governments removed the Wiat and other indigenous peoples from the land and threatened to destroy their cultural practices. The city of Eureka acknowledged the Wiat community, 
their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. This acknowledgement demonstrates the city's commitment to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Thank you for indulging me. And next up will be our um, board and commission reports. And we have uh, Stephanie Lane here from Open, Park, Open Space Parks and Recreation Commission. Hi. Hello. Good evening, friends. Welcome. <laughs> I am. Um I'm going to give you our update. I don't think the, our commission's been here and given the council an update for quite a few years, so looking forward to it. I'm going to steal back the clicker, Miles. I'll do. Psh. Okay. <laughs> sure. Oh, sure. Sure, sure. Yeah. Oh, I got to do the right one. There we go. Okay. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Now we're ready. So I am um, Stephanie Lane. I'm the vice chair of the Open Spaces Parks and Rec Commission, and I've served on the commission for a number of years. I've actually lost count, and I've um, been on and off, so this is my second go around, and it is such a great group of people. So these are the eight folks who make up our commission, and dedicated community members who uh, have a ver wide variety of um, passions, whether it's for our, um, our just our green space, our open space, our forests, our parks, our community services. Um, you'll have a, a group of people who really are committed to making sure that city staff is supported and that um, we are the voice for folks when it comes to open spaces, parks, and rec. So we have four subcommittees on our commission that um, we are all broken into. As you can see, they're Community Forest and Advisory Group, which I believe last week there were some honors going on for the McKay track. So I saw Dennis in that picture. There's what an amazing um, place that is. If anyone in the community has not been there, the McKay track is a wonderful, wonderful spot to go and just get some of that forest bathing, which is really popular these days. Um, but we have a dedicated couple of commission members who are on the Forest Advisory Group. Uh, we have the Sequoia Park Fundraising and Ad Hoc Committee. I'm on that group. Sequoia Park has a huge spot in my heart. As a kid, I would drive my little or ride my little banana seek bike from my house on O Street over to the zoo and the park and spend all my summers there. My parents loved it. So um, seeing that park get some revitalization is really important, and that always comes with funding. Um, we also have the Sequoia Park Zoo Foundation Liaison, which right now is Amy Washburn. And in our last commission meeting, I learned more about flamingos than I ever thought I would know. So come and find me afterwards. I can give you um, all kinds of facts. It, we get such great updates from what the zoo is doing and how the zoo is partnering with the park and um, all of the great collaboration happening. And just as a little tidbit, flamingos live between 20 to 30 years. I didn't realize it was that long. So you never know what you're going to learn when you come to our commission meetings. <laughs> um, and then we have the Cooper jo Gulch Common Grounds Liaison. And I believe that's Jack Borellis and Florence Parks. And so they really work with the neighborhood around Cooper's Gulch to, and um, the city to help bridge um, the needs of everyone in that park. It's one, of our, it's one of our largest parks in the city. I think there's a lot of people who maybe haven't explored beyond the field. So I would urge you all to go check it out. So our powers and duties are probably similar to some of the other commissions, making recommendations, serving in an, advi an advisory capacity to the council and to city staff. Um, we get to, uh, there's lots of kudos that happened in our, in our commission, um, but we also help prepare and recommend programs. We can accept and reject donations of money and property. So if anyone wants to donate land for a park, I'm happy to make a recommendation on that. Um, and then, uh, you know, we're, we're helping to follow the rules and regulations and recommend policies that will help improve our open spaces, parks, and recs. So that should be pretty similar to the duties of other commissions. 
But what's amazing about our commission is that open spaces, parks, and rec might need to be a name I personally think we should update because we liaise, we're with the community services department in the city and what a breadth of programming that department provides, right? It's more than just your traditional city parks um, and open space. So you can see here Empower Eureka volunteer program, so a whole volunteer vein, um, really focusing on neighborhood beautification programs. You might see trees that have popped up on sidewalks around areas and just getting neighborhoods to work together, which anytime you get community members meeting each other in their neighborhood and then working together in their neighborhood, we're just strengthening our community community and the Sequoia Park Ivy League which I love that they are a league because if you have ever been to Sequoia Park and seen the ivy that grows up the trees and starts to choke it after many years it is no easy project to um, remove that ivy and I saw some pictures recently where they had filled an entire dumpster like the largest dumpster we can find in the city and and these dedicated folks had pulled that ivy down and filled that dumpster and I was just I do a lot of yard work at my own home, and man, I know how much work that had to have been. So um, we have also done some updates and had some accomplishments at some of our different parks, the Clara Mayberry Park down by the library, Ross Park, and Sequoia Park Improvement Project Phase 1, which maybe if you've driven by Sequoia Park, you've kind of seen those updates there. There's more to come. The Sequoia Park in the last three years has put in the Redwood Skywalk, which I think we all are aware of. And it's such a gem for our community and really a way that helps bring people to the city and exposes them to the awesome uh, park and zoo that we have. Um, there's also a whole set of volunteer stewards that help manage that Redwood Skywalk. We were put in uh, 15 hydration stations in the city parks, which is amazing. Access to good water um, when you need it, when you're hiking around, when you're running around. There's most, most kids who are on a playground usually need to stop and hydrate. Um, that fog can get us all, whether we don't realize it or not. But um, having those hydration stations is amazing. We have our youth programs and a youth council training up our future leaders to maybe be sitting in your seats someday. And then also some of the special events like the very popular Get Out and Play Day, which happens every year in July, a whole range of activities to get people out and having fun. And then, of course, bringing a little Star Wars into our recreation with May the 4th. So... There's a bunch of upcoming projects, and uh, just to list a couple here. So if you've driven past Carson Park, you can see there's some construction happening, and there's updates right now going on with the park restroom and the basketball court. Um, that's one of my favorite parks in the city because it's surrounded by streets, and it's so visible. And every time I drive by and see a family out there, a group of people playing or dogs running around, it is, to me, it just is like... Um, such a focus point to remind us all to get out and play and to recreate and, and to use our space properly that we have um, all stewarded as much as we possibly can. So 2030 Park, which hopefully will have a new name. There's a survey out right now so everyone can vote. Everyone can vote. <laughs> you can get on to um, the community services website, and I believe the link is there. So you can help choose the new name for 2030 Park. And down there in the corner, the the egret, that design is going to be a, the big part of what that change happens there at that park. So um, it's really, I'm not a super visual person, so I love when we get updates on parks and we can actually see what it's going to look like and incorporating art with play, I think is just really special. Um, then we have Highland Park and uh, their restroom. Restrooms at parks are really important and um, really hard to maintain. And so um, the money that we can grasp onto to make any restroom improvements, you are only going to get a big gold star from community members who use those parks. Um, and then upcoming as well, the Grace Mart Memorial Park. So there's big projects that we're seeking funding for. Um, 
the Carson Park master plan. So not just the updates that are happening now, but a larger vision for that park and how it can um, serve more of our community. The Cooper Gulch Park Master Plan, which has been completed, and we were pretty competitive for one grant that I, I don't think we ended up landing, so we're not stopping there. We're going for more and looking for other sources. And then, of course, the Sequoia Park Improvement Project. And like I mentioned, Sequoia Park is really near and dear to my heart, and seeing the progress of this park, it's not always easy to find funding for, um, but if anyone... I've become a monthly donor to the Sequoia Park Improvement Fund through Humboldt Area Foundation, very easy. Um, and so the more that we can all contribute, the more we can just have these amazing spaces and points of pride in our city. So those are a couple of larger projects on the horizon. So this is, these next two slides are the most incredible slides. These are the lists of grant and private and public funding that we've gotten to make all of these improvements happen. And one thing that's incredible to me, and I didn't think about it until I was sitting here preparing this afternoon for today, this all this grant funding happened since 2019. So a lot of this happened during a pandemic when stress and work was not like it normally is. And the amazing staff that works for community services helped secure and um, get this for our city and our parks. So you can see there's over $7 million that have come in for park projects specifically. Uh, 8.3 million just for the Sequoia Park Zoo. And there's been a lot of um, uh, excitement around that. I'm not going to read them all off because there are quite a few, <laughs> but I believe that the presentation is probably up there publicly somewhere if you guys want to read it. Um, we've had oh, almost $300,000 come in for environmental projects, 75 for the waterfront trail and harbor, and 81000 for the recreation program. So that totals about $15.9 million over the last four years just from city staff for Parks and Rec, which is amazing. And that funding comes from many different um, groups. So there's State of California grants. Um, some money came from Walt Disney. Thanks, Disney. Um, we have private donors. We have rotaries and service clubs in town that help support these projects. We have state and federal funds. Um, local alliances, and many, many, many more. So um, I just, if I, if I could do cartwheels, I would do them. <laughs> it just, it's amazing to me, but also as a, someone who manages people, I also think about the amount of time that was spent um, trying to acquire that. And this is always my, my annual, give us more money <laughs> in the budget. So I love having that um, uh, collaborative budget uh, policy that you guys are all putting together and maybe some maybe some younger than teens maybe some young small people will come and tell us uh, their creative ideas on how we can help get more money into our parks and, and into our, our programs so I can go on for a long time but I would invite you to come and visit our commission if you have time on the fourth Thursday of any month I promise you there'll be lots of smiles and giggles and jokes uh, throughout the entire time. We try to keep it light. Um, but we really are a commission that gets to live in positivity, like coming and hearing the great things happening at our parks and working with community members to accomplish things. I think when I first started on the commission, the skate park had been in progress for like 19 or 18 years and seeing that completed was such a cool thing and since then seeing all that's happened it's really special and so um thank you for letting me come and give some words i'm also going to invite up bruce rossler who is our commission chair so he can say a couple words too thank you stephanie Oh, Mayor Pro Tem Bergal, council members. Um, I just want to thank the Open Space Park and Recreation Commissioners who, uh, for their service to our community. And uh, we're, they're a, a strongly motivated group of volunteers 
and uh, most of st most uh, stay on the commission for more than six years. I've been on the commission since 1982, Ooh. so wow. maybe before some people were born. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and some of them have become councilmen. At least three, I believe three, including Scott, uh, was had been on our commission. Um, we are so inspired by our, our highly talented and action-oriented staff and, and our innovative recreation directors and uh, our recreation, our, our maintenance crews are just out of this world. I mean, these guys do, with nothing, they do everything. And, they, and so uh, they are so, um, they, they just ignite enthusiasm to our group and I think they keep keep people coming to our meetings and 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 keep us strong as a community um, we're a group with diverse thoughts but we have one goal and that's to strengthen our community through inclusive knowledge and inclusive play and inclusive involvement and I just want to thank all our community volunteers thank you thank you Well, that was fun. Thank you so much. So we are going to move on now to public comment. Um, this is the time for members of the public who wish to be heard on matters that do not appear on the agenda. City Council policy is to limit each speaker to three minutes. Such time allotment or portion thereof shall not be transferred to other speakers. The public will be allowed to speak concurrently with the calling of an agenda item following the staff presentation of that item. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the City Council may not take action on an item that does not appear on the agenda. And I just wanted to read real quick the uh, decorum of this meeting. Um, it seems to get lost sometimes in the excitement of the things that we talk about. Uh, all persons in attendance at public meetings are requested to observe the following rules of civil debate. One, we may disagree, but we will be respectful of one another. Two, all comments will be directed to the issue at hand. Three, personal attacks are unacceptable. And four, applauding or other displays of, of approval or disapproval are discouraged. So with that, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. And if you want to come on up. Good evening, James. Good evening, Council, Hotel Mayor, everybody. Um, I never bring a speech up here. I just come up here and say what's on my mind. So I thought I'd do that on the way from Fortuna to here. I went there behind uh, the sporting goods store when you first come in Eureka. What's that called? Buck Sport. My friend lives in the trailer park back there, and I thought I'd just take a glance back on the waterfront trail to see what's going on. And I knew what I'd see, but I seen a lot of drug addicts back there, basically, is what I seen. So whatever, nothing new. I just moved on, come here. What will I see next? I see about three people almost got ran over. It's a unique situation with Eureka with a freeway running through it, no matter which way you're going. Yeah, very, very dangerous. And I'm not making anything up. This is what I see. And I seen one, and I'm, I won't see another one. Sure enough, quarter mile later, another one. And then the last one right by Angelo is pushing a shopping cart across the road. Just, I mean, just about got clipped. The car changed lanes and almost hit him. And I mean, it all comes down to the basic root of the problem, drug-addicted transients flooding the city of Eureka. I like the idea of the mental health guy that was here. That sounds promising. And the fact that he wants to have a town hall meeting with transparency and open discussion, that really makes me happy. I mean, that's been needed for a long time. I've been coming here for four years, and that's all we've ever asked for. So hopefully something uh, you know improves for the drug addicts' lives too. I mean, I'm not down on them. They need help. They're, you're going to get people ran over in Eureka. And that new big crosswalk with the big fancy lights, I challenge any one of you to go park somewhere near that and watch that and see how many people use that. And you won't see anybody using that. I don't care if they're 50 feet away from it. They're not going to walk up to it and use it. They're going to play leapfrog across the road. One person on the cell phone just barely bumps them, they're dead. You got drug addicts running around Eureka like an open zoo. And I hope something happens to cure that problem. I mean, this ain't the way people are supposed to live. It ain't cool to bring your kids to town, to see people shooting up in alleyways. And also the business owners, I mean, Old Town used to be fun to go there. And now there's just nothing there anymore. I mean, 
it's nothing exciting to see. I used to love to go to the one of the water fountain, whatever it's called, you know, and I think the carriage is still running. That was cool to see, but you just got boarded up businesses and way too many homeless drug addicts. It's just it's just a band-aid on your Eureka. Something's gotta be done about it. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, will I get a welcome too? Welcome, Cornelius. Thank you. You're it's welcome. nice to be treated like a human being, not being called a hate monger. But uh, that be as it is, the program that you initiate, I applaud you. We should have had that years and years and years and years ago. I mean, since the opening of Hatcher in 2016, this town has been in a total downward spiral, known throughout the internet and beyond, that it is a mecca, a magnet for the openly warehoused, untreated, drug riddled derelicts that flock into eureka like there is no tomorrow and there might not be one but that maybe as it is i always remind me uh, i'm always reminded of that uh german it millionaire that recently got robbed in old town with his 10 year old daughter and lost his passports in the process but that is also just another nice pointer on how quickly this town is going to you know where your narrative has more holes than a swiss cheese or the titanic for that matter and MS Eureka is taking on water fast, drowning like a stone in the humble bay. People are wising up to the fact that all of you are entirely inequipped to man maneuver this ship through any form of crisis, from the opioid to the economic crisis that is, and that Eureka is blatantly mismanaged by a group of utopists and self-promoting amateurs. Uh, uh, plummeting is a word that comes to mind if you look at uh, how Eureka has fared since 2016, same year that the future Madame, a.k.a. Mayor, uh, came onto council and established uh, by now a sad tradition of grant whoring and constant attempts to cover up for the city's failing and failed policies. Even our sheriff called Eureka a depleted, depressed zombie wasteland on NPR Radio's California report years ago, and your little utopia has quickly turned into a dystopia for everyone clear to see. The silencing of those that addressed those most pressing issues hasn't worked either, and to kill the messenger via slander and, de and defamation or economic persecution doesn't make the problems go away. In, in fact, they keep growing. The hubris you exhibit by clamoring onto the public's positions is another clear sign that you are uh, driven by ego and greed and the lust for power, not your willingness to serve. You even lack campaign promises, the most basic form of campaigning, even if you break them all once you are voted, or rather ushered in, into office. What happened to the whole COVID scare? To the fear, the panic, the lockdowns and lock out of the public from City Hall? Will you ever admit that you blindly followed orders, abolished the principles of an open society in our constitution? Who will be held responsible for the uh, small businesses that closed? The economic fallout, you're immoral, unconstitutional, and phys physically ins irresponsible, and entirely unwilling to reverse your stand on false assumptions and failed policies you promoted and enforced. If you had any integrity and morals, and thereby a dignity left, or uh, you would all resign and have a new election set up with an interim council to manage the affairs of this city. Make Eureka safe again. Thank you, Cornelius. Come on up. So on a different vein, <laughs> I'm Lynn McKenna from the Redwood Coast Music Festival, and we just finally got to celebrate our 30th anniversary this past weekend, and it was really a super fun event. I saw more people from out of town than I've ever seen at a festival. They all had a wonderful time. They thought we have a delightful community, and they felt very welcome here, and they loved our venues and all the music we were able to provide. None of that would have been possible without sponsors and our participants that come and attend. So in getting ready for our 30th anniversary, I am the sponsorship chairperson for the music festival, and I discovered a really unique fact. We have eight businesses, seven businesses, and the city of Eureka who have sponsored, partnered, and supported the festival for all 30 of our years, which is a phenomenal feat. So um, you weren't able to come to our presentation Thursday night at the kickoff dance, but we had awards or certificates of appreciation. So this is the one for the city. And it says Redwood Coast Music Festival appreciates and thanks the city of Eureka for your 30 years of support and sponsorship. So this is for the city. And I would just like to acknowledge the other eight businesses. 
so or seven businesses so it was best western plus humboldt bay inn which has changed its name many times but they've been there every year the city of eureka coast central credit union eureka broadcasting radio station recology humboldt county red lion hotel redwood news and the time standard so thank you again for your support thank you lynn wow pretty awesome can you see it up there <laughs> yes ma'am Thank you so much, Lynn. You're welcome. Thanks. Okay, is there anybody else here in the chambers that wanted to public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll go over to Zoom. Uh, is Duria? That Duria? Yeah, hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so good evening, everybody. My name is Duria Sayed, and I'm an outreach analyst for the California Department of Insurance. I'm happy to be with you to give you an update on the work we have been doing on your behalf. Um, California is so prone to wildfires. So I want to touch bases on the Safer from Wildfire framework and interagency partnership between Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara and the Emergency Response and Readiness Agencies in Governor Newsom's administration. Its purpose is to protect lives, homes, and businesses by reducing wildfire risk. We've been working with Cal Fire, Cal OES, Governor's Office of Planning and Research, and the California Public Utilities Commission. And our department is using every tool available to improve insurance for our communities. So the, the, the direct experience of, we are taking into account the direct experience of uh, first responders and the latest research on the wildfires so that this partnership can have a consistent approach to reducing risk with list of achievable, certifiable, and effective actions to make help uh, existing homes and businesses safer from wildfires. So it's basically a ground up approach where it's, we call it SFW123. Number one, protect the structure, such as making sure your roof and vents are up to code. Number two, the immediate surroundings, such as a brush too close to your home or any other flammable item stored under your deck. And the finally is the community, involving your entire community to prevent wildfires from catching and spreading to homes and businesses in the neighborhood. Um, this includes enhanced infrastructure and programs like FireWise. And good news is that a that few weeks ago, Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara submitted his insurance pricing regulation to the California Office of Administrative Law that would recognize and reward wildfire safety and mitigation efforts made by homeowners and businesses. We are expecting um, uh, that these regulations and everything will be in place, uh, the whole process to be done by 2023. And honestly, I just wanted to come here and tell you that I'm your outreach analyst for the California Department of Insurance. And if your constituents or anybody in your community is going through any issues with uh, insurance, please call our hotline number 800-927-4357. Go on our website. We have so many tools available um, to buy insurance, residential insurance, and how to uh, you know, avoid fraud and stuff. Um, it's insurance.ca.gov. And I'm proud to say that if we don't answer your phone call, our callback time is two minutes. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, next we have, uh, excuse me. Thank you. Next we have A. Christensen. I uh, am really also really pleased with the mental health um, crisis mobile unit. That sounds awesome. Um, it was a great presentation and council asked very good questions. Um, I was also really pleased to hear about the participatory budgeting um, movement. Uh, I've, I've done it before in other cities. It's a great thing. Um, I did just look up um, there's apparently no minimum age in California at which youth can participate in uh, voting. Um, Hayward, it's ages 10 plus. Vallejo, 14 plus. San Francisco, 16 plus. Oakland actually uses no minimum age at all. So I would encourage the council to um, at least allow 14 and up, um, you know, maybe even 10 and up to participate in that. Thank you. Thank you. And next up is Dino and Deb. Yes, hi. Thank you. It's Deb. D Dino's here. Hi, Deb. <laughs> but, um, thank you for um, 
allow me to say something. Um, I'm just, uh, I initially got on this evening relating to the sewer lateral uh, project that or what was coming before you guys this evening. And obviously that got slated, but I would love to see that back on the agenda soon. I'm, we are property owners here in Eureka and in the process of attempting to do a remodel on our home. And in that process, we got kind of shocked with that sewer lateral piece. And that, I mean, not, not only that it needed to be done, but also then the sticker shock of what goes with that, that could potentially make our remodel project completely unfeasible, um, especially in this day and age as the cost of everything has gone up. So I would just, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that on your agenda again. Um, just, yeah, and, and it, this process, unfortunately this permitting process, we are now, it started in April and we are months out. Uh, and it's, I feel like right now, the hang up now is that sewer lateral piece of it. And I, I'm hoping, yeah, it again, it will be on the agenda. Um, soon, <laughs> one of your next chances. So that's all. Thank you all for all the work that you do. Thank you, Deb. Um, is there anybody else on Zoom that wants to comment? I don't see anybody. Do you? No? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the agenda um, to the public hearing on unmet, tra unmet transit needs. Uh, may we have a report, please? Good evening, evening, Madam Mayor and City Council members. I'll be doing the presentation this evening for you regarding the public hearing about unmet transit needs. I'm going to share my screen. Can you guys all see that? Yes. All right. So we're doing a public. Oh. Is that better? Can you guys see it better now? Yeah, it's larger. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. So um, if there are any Anyone interested, interested parties um, who would like more information regarding the unmet transit needs, there are some handouts available next to the podium. So you can grab those um, at the end or during the presentation. So un unmet transit needs. State law requires Humboldt County Association of Government, HCOG, to annually evaluate the unmet transit need within its jurisdiction and prepare a report of its findings. As a part of the process, entities receiving Transportation Development Act funds may conduct separate hearings to gather input as to any unmet needs within the area. Any information gathered tonight will be forwarded to HCOG for consideration of these needs. Unmet transit needs definitions and reasonable to meet criteria. Unmet transit needs first, trips, trip requests from residents who do not have access to public transportation, specialized transportation, or private transport services or resources to travel for daily activities, such as work, medical appointments, education, shopping, etc. And second, proposed public transportation, specialized transportation, or private transport services, such as transportation development plan, regional transportation plan, and coordinated public transit. Reasonable to meet, to be considered reasonable to meet, a service must be operational, feasibly, operationally feasible and financially sustainable. Service must have adequate roadways and must be safe to operate. Services must, must be projected to meet a minimum marginal fare box return ratio of 10% within two years. Services shall not be made by comparing unmet transit needs with the need for streets and roads for the allocation of TDA funds. Once a service is determined to be reasonable to meet, 
and is implemented, ride share should be evaluated at six months intervals to determine if service meets performance standards. Recommendation, hold a public hearing, accept comments and testimony regarding any unmet transit needs within the city of Eureka area, direct staff to forward a transcript of the comment to Humboldt County Association of Governments for inclusion in the unmet needs report of findings for the 2023-2024. I request that you open the public hearing regarding the unmet transit needs. Thank you. Um, so is there anybody? Oh, I need to open the public hearing. Are there any questions from council? Um, so now we'll open it up for public comment is in public for the public hearing uh, is anyone here to comment on this item That's fine. Kristen, project manager k ray can you stop sharing please thank yes. you Great. and then we have a christensen is our first speaker thank you all right um gonna keep it quick uh, one of the big needs is maps and signage. Uh, none of the bus stops in the county currently have a map of the RTS routes. I don't believe any of the Eureka Transit routes um, currently have maps. Um, there's need for more directional signage just so people know where the bus goes, where it can take them. Uh, so that's point number one. Point number two is service to the Eureka Public Library. Uh, there's currently no way to get directly there. Um, you either have to walk from 2nd and L or you have to cross, you know, likely 4th or 5th Street from the RTS, which is very dangerous. There's no traffic light there. Um, so I'd like to request direct service to the library. There's plenty of room to turn a bus around. Uh, next point. From what I hear, the bus pass that College of the Redwood students receive works on the Redwood Transit bus, but does not work on the Eureka Transit buses. Um, so students who are trying to use transit have to either walk to the RTS bus or pay a fare on Eureka Transit, then get on RTS. Um, so I'd like to see that fixed. Um, and then <laughs> later and more frequent service during Arts Alive. Um, this past Friday, I was on my way out the door to catch the bus to go to Arts Alive and found a lost dog. So I missed my bus. Um, and then, you know, I got a, a, a ride there um, after we dropped off the dog. <laughs> um, at the end of Arts Alive, I missed the bus by about a minute. So um, there was no more buses and I had to, again, get a ride home. Um, the service is really infrequent. So I'd like to see Eureka Transit and Redwood Transit <laughs> both offer later service just that one Saturday night, more frequent service just that one Saturday night. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And next we have uh, Colin Fisk. Good evening, council members. This is Colin Fisk with CRTP, the Coalition for Responsible Transportation Priorities. I want to make a kind of general comment. Um, as you heard uh, from your staff, the unmet transit needs process is, I think, both an important way to uh, provide public input on uh, the transit system and also uh, a necessary way to access uh, funding for the public transit system due to you know, state regulations. But you also heard that there are a lot of limitations on this process and particularly on what unmet needs you know, can be actually met. And one of the big limitations on that is funding. And so I just want to uh, encourage the Eureka City Council to uh, look into additional sources of funding for transit, including supporting you know, the inclusion of public transit in the potential transportation uh, tax ballot measure that's being considered at a countywide level um, so that we can make sure that more of these unmet transit needs that are identified can actually be met. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Um, and Mayor, we don't need a vote on this particular matter. Um, we record the comments and we can direct them 
to HTA. Great, thank you. Thanks for speaking, everybody. Okay, so we'll move on then to the consent calendar. All matters listed under this category are considered to be routine by the City Council and will be enacted by one motion. Unless a specific request is made by a council member, the consent calendar will not be read. There will be no separate discussion of these items. However, if discussion is required, that item will be removed from the consent calendar and considered separately. Would anyone like to pull an item from the consent calendar? No? Great. Okay, so do we have a motion to approve the balance of the consent calendar or the consent calendar? So moved. I'll second. Great, thank you. Uh, please vote. Council Member Bauer? Aye. And okay. unanimous yes vote motion carries. Great. All right. Legislative action correspondence. Are there any correspondence items that council would like to add? No. Seeing none, we'll move on to ordinances and red ordinances and resolutions. Uh, coastal land use plan report by principal planner Kristen Kenyon. Uh, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council members. Let me just pull up my uh, PowerPoint. Can you all see that? Yes. yes. Awesome. Okay. Um, so my report this evening is to share information on the coastal land use plan amendment process and receive feedback on the draft division statements and introduction chapter for the new plan. So the city of Eureka, as we all know, is partly in the coastal zone. The coastal zone is generally described as including everything west of Broadway, north of Third Street, and east of Myrtle Avenue. The city's local coastal program, or LCP for short, regulates development in the city's coastal zone. And LCPs and LCP amendments require certification by the California Coastal Commission um, as being in conformance with the California Coastal Act. So an LCP consists of two parts, the land use plan, or LUP, and the implementation plan, or IP. Uh, the LUP is comprised of the components of a city's general plan and land use map pertaining to the coastal zone. We will be referring to the LUP as the coastal element of the general plan. The IP is comprised of parts of the municipal code, including the zoning map and development and resource protection standards pertaining to the coastal zone. And we often refer to the IP as the coastal zoning code. So the city is beginning the process of comprehensively updating our LUP. And once the LUP update is submitted to the Coastal Commission for certification, we'll begin the process of updating the IP. Um, so what's the impetus for this? Well, the city recently adopted a comprehensive update to its general plan in 2018 called the 2040 general plan because it has a 20 year planning horizon with the next major update slated for 2040. This new general plan is not yet effective in the coastal zone until the LUP is updated. So until the LUP is updated and that update is um, certified by the Coastal Commission, the 1997 general plan continues to be the guiding document for development in the coastal zone. This has been a point of frustration for those who participated in the 2040 general plan update process and have not yet seen their vision put into action. As a result, Council has made the LUP update part of its strategic vision. Um, so the general plan update process included a lot of community outreach and engagement from 2012 through 2018. Um, and general plan policies were developed as general expressions of intent and were selected and written for a 20 year planning horizon. Um, so the purpose of the LUP update is to retire our old 1997 general plan and make our new modern 2040 general plan effective in the coastal zone. And we realize it's been a few years since the general plan was adopted and a lot has happened. 
um, in that time and some changes to our policies will be needed to address that, but we aren't starting from square one. This is really a continuation of our general plan process. Um, so staff proposes to make the LUP, the new LUP, a standalone element of the 2040 general plan called the coastal element. Um, and it'll duplicate relevant portions of other 2040 general plan elements and include additional policies and maps ne necessary to carry out the Coastal Act. And it'll become the standard of review for coastal development permits in the coastal zone, along with our coastal zoning code. So what topics does an LUP or coastal element need to cover? Um, by definition, it covers the type, location, and intensity of land uses in the coastal zone. Um, and it also must include resource protection and development policies necessary to carry out all Coastal Act topics of concern. And Coastal Act topics of concern include, um, but aren't limited to coastal dependent industry, public access and recreation, archeological resources, agriculture, visitor serving uses, especially lower cost visitor serving accommodations, coastal hazards, wetlands, water qualities, environmentally sensitive habitat, fishing and boating, and visual and scenic character. character. Um, and some 2040 general plan topics that are not relevant to the Coastal Act include housing, economic development, and noise. So it's a lot of the 2040 general plan topics, but not all of them. So staff is proposing the LUP coastal element be organized into six chapters, with the sixth chapter being a glossary. And a draft introduction chapter has been included in your meeting packet, starting with overarching vision statements. Um, from now through January, staff plans to bring one or more draft chapters per month to the Planning Commission and City Council for review and comment, along with the relevant terms from the glossary. Um, so the Planning Commission has already provided comments on the draft introduction at their September hearing. Um, the Planning Commission will then make a recommendation to the City Council on the entire document at a scheduled public hearing, uh, followed by Council holding a public hearing to adopt the element and transmit it to the Coastal Commission for certification, hopefully in early spring. Um, so, so like I mentioned, the vision and introduction have been included in your agenda packet as attachment one to the staff report for your review and comment. And um, we're particularly interested in thoughts on the draft vision statements. There are currently 28 in total, um, and some are directly from the vision of the 2040 general plan and some are new. Uh, in attachment one, the language from the 2040 general plan is shown in purple. This color coding is to aid in review and will be removed in the final version. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to read the vision statements verbatim, but just give a brief overview of the topics covered by the vision statements. Uh, but if council wants to dive into the details, I can bring up the exact language. Um, so vision statement topics include providing coastal access and recreation, promoting multimodal transportation, creating an environment that inspires healthy and active living, strengthening our sense of connection to the waterfront, improving Broadway in a number of ways, um, implementing context-specific parking strategies, prioritizing infill and adaptive reuse of vacant and underutilized land. And there's even a specific vision statement just about redeveloping the balloon track, uh, promoting a mix of uses with housing near jobs and services, providing adequate public services, preparing for natural disasters, sea level rise and climate change, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, the other side of that, uh, preserving natural resources, supporting a diverse, resilient local economy, promoting Old Town and the commercial <coughs> bayfront as a destination for residents and visitors, encouraging growth in the tax base, implementing streamlined and flexible permitting processes, championing coastal dependent and relating, related industries, protecting and growing our understanding of seaport heritage and tribal history, addressing homelessness, and promoting environmental justice. 
Um, so that's it for my presentation. Excited to hear feedback. Does anybody have any feedback? Council Member Arroyo? Thank you. This is great that we're embarking on this section at a time, and I, I appreciate the chance to um, ask questions and provide thoughts. Um, and yeah, just thank you for helping move this forward. I, I guess my question is around, um, I know that, you know, in the vision statements, it talks about um, short, medium, and long-term adaptation strategies for areas uh, vulnerable to sea level rise. I wondered if there's any benefit to us being more specific in this vision portion about that and also um, explicitly saying any, you know, w that we want to pursue inter interim uses for coastal dependent zones. I don't know how luck how successful we're going to be <laughs> with that, but I see that the county has really included that in their code. And, um, you know, I, I guess I'm hopeful that there could be some interim uses of um, coastal dependent land in particular. I wondered about your insight since you have um, some super valuable background to, to bring to the table here on that. Yes, one of our main goals um, is to really push uh, for more flexibility on CDI lands. And there isn't a, an explicit statement about that in the vision, but there is a vision statement that talks about adaptive reuse of existing properties, including by um, like promoting adaptive reuse, including by um, increasing flexibility of use and development standards. So in that, I was, we were trying to say, we were thinking about the CD islands and the need to increase flexibility of use to ensure that those properties are maintained. Because um, right now they're just kind of falling apart because nobody's using them. And I'd add to that, you know, we, we've discussed this at a staff level about interim uses and more flexibility. I think we really want to emphasize more flexibility than necessarily interim uses. I believe that some of the restrictions from interim uses is getting the investment that you want to see in the community for such a short period of time. And so looking at flexibility and looking at, you know, principally permitted uses and conditionally permitted uses and how flexible we can get with that, I think would benefit us from an economic development perspective and investment in our community. I guess I'm curious if um, identifying those as separate things might be, I mean, I understand that adaptive reuse and um, flexibility are kind of aiming in that direction or encompassing more than just interim uses, but, but it could include that. I just wondered if there's any I guess my concern is that if we move forward with, you know, in the future, trying to um, reuse some of these areas and then find that it hits a wall, I just don't want to see us like throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I wonder if they're if specifically saying that we would like to pursue interim uses where other development opportunities aren't available, if there's any value in that as a vision and as like something that we spell out in more detail. And I'm, I'm really, you know, open to staff thoughts on that. Um, if you think this is inclusive enough, then, then great. I think that's a good idea. Were you also thinking about um, interim uses on sites that maybe are too hot, like uh, vulnerable to sea level rise later on too? Is that why you were talking about the sh short, medium, and long term? Yes, I was thinking about both CDI um, uh, restrictions and like uh, temporal restrictions on development. Um, and so thinking about sort of both um, was why, yeah, why I honed in on that. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's a good idea. I could, we could try to put something together about that and have a specific vision statement about it. Uh, and I agree. I think that another thing that we're looking at is just the inventory of coastal dependent industrial that we have. Um, and making an argument that A, we have a pretty large inventory, but B, that of that inventory, there's a lot of parcels that aren't usable as CDI. And then there'll be the discussion as to what those get rezoned as um, if we're successful in that argument. I mean, if you look at all the property from Del Norte down to Pound Road, there's a lot of CDI property there that literally could never be utilized under that zoning designation. And so 
there'll be a lot of discussions about what those turn into. And is that something that we're going to define as we go through this process? Yes, uh, that'll be when we talk about the land use chapter okay. and the land use map. Um, I think in terms of, um, you know, there was a lot of talk with landowners back when the general plan update was happening because uh, we did adopt a land use map for the entire city. Um, it's just not effective yet in the coastal zone. And there was a lot of proposed mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. redesignation of CDI land. Gotcha. So we'll relook at that. And that's where we'll make the case for this should be changed because the boats can't get here no more, basically, right? Like, right. We're gonna ha um, Coastal Commission is going to want to see us analyze site by site which ones maybe are, are less appropriate and which ones maybe need to be retained because they're on a deep water channel, they have a dock, that kind of thing. Okay. Great. Council Member Castellano. Thanks. Um, and thank you, Principal Planner Kenyon. I really appreciate the just the detail and thoroughness and all the definitions. Um, I learned why things are called an element. I had never actually like thought about that before. Um, so a couple, just a couple brief things I was thinking about in relationship to the vision. Um, we talk about diverse and resilient local economy um, in terms of our coastal community, but I'm especially, you know, we have the cultural district that's right there along the waterfront. You can probably anticipate what I'm going to say. I just think something about, you know, our coastal community bullet point celebrates cultural diversity or something along that nature. Um, a lot of the um, cultural district meetings I attend, people talk about just wanting and, and it, there's a real strong interest in more representation of all of the different cultural perspectives in, in Eureka in our kind of boardwalk, old town, coastal area. Um, and then the other one in my mind, and it's like, I feel like there's threads of it in here, but you know, I know like Fort Bragg has been doing a lot of work around the blue green economy. Um, and you know, that's definitely kind of a maybe a bit of a buzzword term, but you know, it's also kind of a point of interest and potential for, you know, like regional partnerships around developing the blue green economy. And so I was just thinking something about, again, doesn't have to be this exact wording. I don't think, you know, you'll probably come up with something better, but like promotes and builds infrastructure or something around the blue green economy. And, sorry, just one more thing. I and maybe and maybe this will be coming up later. You know, I know looking at like the per, you know the the wind per, you know proposed wind development. Um, you know, in terms of our coastal dependent industrial lands, that um, you know that those sites will be of interest. So I'm not I'm not I guess it's a question maybe I have for you is does it make sense in some way to reference wind at this point or would that be kind of later on uh, to have some sort of reference, you know, or or does it just does it really matter if we get that like specific about types of industries? That might be getting more specific than we need for the um, for the vision statements, uh, but um, I like the idea of a general statement about, um, you know, getting into the blue green economy or or whatever, however we we phrase it. Um, Thanks. <laughs> Great, Councilmember Moulton. My question is actually for uh, Council Member Castellano. What do you mean by blue green economy? Can you can you elevator pitch that for me? <laughs> well, I'm going to watch some definition now. It'll be great. Um, you know, basically that's uh, economic development practices kind of based around kind of mariculture, aquaculture, like the ocean, um, but also sort of the movement towards you know like green energy. Um, and and development infrastructure. Okay. But I, I may be missing some nuance there. So, so. blue yeah. is in water, green is in like granola. It's green. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you. Wind energy is a perfect example. 
Uh, Council Member Bauer. Trying to unmute myself. Um, Principal, <laughs> Principal Planner Kenyon, thank you. Um, I think the vision statement or the coastal, you know, our, our, our vision statement is great. Um, I think my question is more of about CDI. Um, has Coastal Commission um, approved of, you know, kind of significant changes anywhere? I mean, it's, I think it's really important for us, right? I mean, we all, I think we all understand that, but I'm just curious, is this something that we can hope hope will happen um, that we can you know do different things with certain areas of our of our city just curious what, what's your thoughts on that yes it's it's totally uh feasible we humboldt county did a market study recently for the all of humboldt bay showing that even with wind energy coming in um we would still have like 400 acres of excess CDI land or something incredible like that. Um, so there's there's already been the background research done to just like prove we have too much of it. And then we just have to do the site specific analysis to explain like why the sites we're choosing to, to zone out of it are the like the least appropriate for it um, and, and that we're retaining the most appropriate sites for it. Um, and then uh, like Sven mentioned, you know, Humboldt County got the um, their interim use provisions passed that allows non CDI uses at, of a temporary nature on CDI land. Um, and we are planning on uh, pushing for secondary non CDI uses and um, more conditional uses that are non CDI. And it's interesting because um, when these LCPs around Humboldt Bay were certified, uh, there was just a vision of having a ton of CDI of being this big port. And so they, they zoned more than um, they had then. Like it, there wasn't even this much CDI land when it got zoned and designated this way. So um, it's always been more than we've had. And what's crazy is that in neither of the um, Humble counties or our, or Eureka's LCPs, like uh, timber processing is not even a conditional use on CDI land. And that's what a lot of the CDI land is or was historically was timber processing. Um, uh, so I could see that definitely being allowed as a conditional use. Um, and the Coastal Commission has, has said that, that they would likely be amenable to that um so great i yeah i have hopes i mean we're gonna try to push the envelope and we might get some suggested modifications on what what we do but um yeah i think awesome. we'll some of it at least approved <laughs> <laughs> thank you um and kristen gets sorry principal planner gets just texted me to remind me that um you know when we do the coastal element we'll be amending the general plan so if any of these things we want to make just general plan vision statements instead of only coastal element vision statements, we could do that too. That's great. Are there any further questions or comments? Well, thank you so much for being here. We'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Thanks for all the great feedback. Uh, we do need to take public comment. It's Excuse a report, me. even though we're not taking action on it. Okay, so um, we are taking public comment on this item. Is there anybody from the public that would care to comment? Seeing no one, we'll bring it back. Again, thank you so much uh, for your report, and we'll see you next time. And generally, we take a break at 8. It's 10 minutes to 8, and we have... Um, Two more items. I'm curious as to how everybody's doing. Would you like to just power through or would you care to uh, take a two minute break? Two minutes. Well, how about three and a half? Two minutes. I, I'm happy to power through. Okay. For a then bit. And that at is least. what we shall do. We don't have to vote on that, right? No. <laughs> two thumbs up. Yeah. Scott can leave anytime. Okay, so we are going to move on then to the Streetscape Improvement Fund uh, with 
manager, project manager Swan Asbury. Hi, everybody. Hi, Swan. Hi, Swan. <laughs> All right. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, tonight, I am bringing before you a Street Peak Improvement Fund. Uh, when we updated the zoning code, we made a lot of changes that encourage development in Eureka, and we're starting to see property owners take advantage of those changes with increased development. And with these developments come city requirements uh, to make public improvements. And these improvements include construction or reconstruction of curbs, gutters, sidewalks, driveway approaches, pavement, and necessary drainage facilities. And so we would like to take this one step further and offer a loan to fund street space improvements that go beyond these minimum requirements. The so staff is requesting the ability to offer loans up to $250,000, bearing an interest rate of 3% with a term of 15 years to businesses that are going above and beyond the required improvements. We are asking for $500,000 to be allocated to this fund 450,000 will be coming from economic development and 50,000 will be coming from the general fund. These expenditures will be reimbursed over time and the general fund will be the first to be made whole. Loans of up to 100,000 may be approved by the city manager with loans between 100,000 and 250,000 requiring city council approval. City staff would like to encourage streetscape improvements beyond what is required, such as sidewalks, curb extensions, landscape buffers, planters, seating, public art, lighting, and bike parking. All projects will need to comply with our current city codes, ordinances, rules, regulations, and design guidelines, and of course, building permits will likely be needed. Before, during, and after the improvements are made, the city shall have the right to inspect all the work. The project is not going to be qualified for funding unless all improvements have been completed to the satisfaction of the city. Street space improvements must be designed by an architect, landscape architect, or engineer licensed for practice in the state of California. Interested applicants will begin by reaching out to our economic development staff. Uh, we will have program information on the city's website depending on the scope of work and on-site review of the proposed street space improvements by the owner and or lessee and staff may be desirable to facilitate the proper progression of the design and project review process. Development services, public works, and economic development departments will review the proposed improvements to determine whether to approve. Staff will need to be notified about contracts awarded for services connected with the approved street space improvements for all improvements for which financial assistance is requested shall be provided and verified by staff prior to the payment of any loan funds. Um, pursuant to the Eureka Municipal Code, street space improvements valued in excess of 25000 and which have a financial contribution from the city shall require a payment of prevailing wages in accordance with the requirements of the California Labor Code. And the street space improvements as designed, approved, and constructed cannot be altered for 15 years without city review and approval. The improvements funded in part by the city must be maintained in good condition for the period of the loan. So that's it for my um, presentation about the program. I'm happy to answer questions. I have some suggested language for you, and I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions from council? Councilmember Arroyo. I got a public question about this um, today that I thought was a good one. And in reviewing the um, agenda summary I, I, in, your, in your presentation, I wasn't 100% clear. Will this be a revolving loan fund? Like when money comes in, can we then loan it back out? Or, okay, I was assuming so, but it wasn't. Um, I, I don't know a ton about the different structures of loan funds like this. So thank you. So we'll be able to make lots of loans, hopefully. Cool. We hope to make lots of loans, and, and we're excited about how many projects are happening in Eureka, and, and we just want to encourage them to, to do all the extra stuff that they want to do. Okay. Any other questions? Councilmember Arroyo. 
<laughs> me again. Um, I also was just wondering in um, when people are going through the building permit process, um, will will we be proactively letting people know this is an option? Um, what what do you kind of envision in that realm? Definitely. Usually public works that um, communicates about these public improvements that are required. And so um, we'll have um, program information available for them to share. And then um, we'll be working with public works to, to reach out to folks that um, we think would be fit for this. Okay, and then just one last one. Can this be used to address sidewalk gaps in neighborhoods? We have a we have a fair number of those. So I think that typically with a development that comes in, it would be a part of the required public improvements in the right of way. So mm -hmm. if there was a project that did have sidewalk gaps and it triggered the amount that was spent, I think the regular PIR it would be required. So it likely wouldn't fall underneath this program because it'd be required as a part of the development. Yeah, I, I I think I knew that. I was thinking about people that proactively are like, I'm not doing any development like in a residential neighborhood, but I want to find a way to finance this um, sidewalk gap. Like if, <laughs> if someone's like, I really want to make it easier for kids to walk to school in my neighborhood. I don't know. I, I mean, is this something that like that exists in my neighborhood. Um, I'm not sure that those property owners have like proactively tried to figure out how to address the problem. Um, but is that an eligible use, I guess? Is that something we need to think more about? Uh, looks like Council I'm, Member Castellano well, may it, have an it answer for It does say you. it's for business and commercial property owners. So I don't know if that it seems like that would exclude most of the uses you just mentioned, but I'll defer to <laughs> it. It would exclude the residential um, component of that, but I guess there could be an instance where you're in a certain zoning district adjacent to residential. Um, or someone could be a I landlord of a bunch of properties that could be their commercial venture, and they... I mean, I know we're kind of like blurring the line there, but okay. I guess maybe my, my better question might be, should we extend this to residential zones for the purpose of addressing sidewalk gaps? I think that if we did that, that this revolving Lund fund would maybe get depleted. I'm not sure. I don't know what the interest level is, so it would be hard to tell. Um, I think that if we were interested in that, it may be a discussion with our finance director and staff about maybe a, comp uh, a different program specific to that. I, I see Director Gerving um, reacting, maybe. <laughs> nope, nope, not reacting at all. Okay, never mind. Councilmember Castellano? I could be wrong, but aren't we looking at some sort of, or at least contemplating some sort of program for sidewalk, funding sidewalk repairs or things like that for more residential uses? Isn't that a, like... Um, Similar to the sewer lateral, you know, like doing, like being able to do a bunch of them throughout the city all together. Anyone? Miles? I'm sorry, I was discussing uh, uh, Councilmember Arroyo's um, <laughs> question. Could you ask that question again, please? Director Gerving may have an answer. I just, it's, I thought it's kind of similar to the sewer lateral, like we were considering a program specific to sidewalk repairs of like ag potentially like aggregating projects and, and creating a uh, pathway to you know success for completing those kinds of projects we were not as a part of this no 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 that's what aren't we considering that as a no what we've done in the past is so we we have an annual sidewalk improvement project it's typically based on those sidewalks that we're responsible for um, sometimes when we go through a process with private property owners where there is a hazard or a, a defect in a privately owned sidewalk, we'll mark it, we'll notify the, the, the property owner multiple times, and when we don't get compliance and not getting fixed, sometimes we will add that to our sidewalk improvement project, get it fixed, and then put a lien on the property for, the, the, to, for that to be repaid. We haven't done anything with a loan program or haven't been considering that. Okay. 
No further questions. We'll open this up for public comment. Is there anyone from the public who would like to comment? Colin Fisk. Thank you. Good evening again, council members. Uh, Colin Fisk with CRTP. Uh, yeah, I appreciate this idea. I think it's a really interesting um, program and look forward to uh, seeing streetscape improvements. Um, I think that the list of um, applicable or eligible improvements that staff provided is a good one. I want to um, just, I guess, clarify that I, um, and I'm, I'm sure this is maybe a given, but to make sure that anything that gets added to the streetscape uh, doesn't uh, obstruct the sidewalk. And actually, it would be maybe nice uh, on the topic of sidewalks if an eligible uh, improvement in some cases would be removing sidewalk obstructions. So um, just that one thought. But uh, other than that, thanks for doing this. Thank you, Colin. I don't see anyone else, do you? OK, so we'll bring it back to council for comments or an motion. Councilmember Moulton. I move that we adopt the Streetscape Improvement Fund Program and allocate $500,000 in funds available to businesses and commercial property owners making significant streetscape improvements. I second. Thank you. I've had a motion and a second. Any further comments? Oh, we have a comment. <laughs> Councilmember Castellano. <laughs> yeah, hi. Um, sorry. Uh, First, just I'm super excited about this. So um, thank you for bringing this forward. I think it's brilliant. Um, and what was I going to say? I could imagine us wanting to expand it. You know, if projects can be up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars, you know, this potentially could could only fund two projects, and then you know, paid back over fifteen years. But you know, especially I could imagine you know, with upcoming housing developments, that this could be something that, you know, if it's successful, we may want to, you know, include in RFPs as something that, you know, the city has available or things like that to really think about as we're doing these developments, you know, kind of just making the city more livable and accessible to the public kind of on a, on a real, just on a wider basis. So I'm, I'm excited to start here. Totally support this. Um, and thanks. Thank you. Any further comments? Please vote. Council Member Bauer. Aye. Okay, unanimous yes vote, motion carries. Great. And now we're going to move to future agenda, future, future, am I speaking tonight, huh? Future agenda items. Do many members of the council wish to propose an item for placement on a future agenda? Okay, I have one too, but go ahead. You can go first. Can I go first? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I'm really excited about mine. Can I? OK. So, <laughs> so at our last meeting, we discussed um, the Dolbeer and W Street couplet. And as you all are aware, we voted that down. Um, and primarily, my understanding was we voted it down. At least my take on that was because of you know, child, the kids' safety. Um, so I would like, as a council, to bring that back um, and to look at that, uh, working with the city um, and I, or with, excuse me, with the school. I did um, watch the meeting two different times uh, and listen to public comment, and it seems that we have at least two school board members who thought it was a good idea. They thought that, not a good idea, they thought there would be options out there, so they may be amenable. So um, with the engineering, um, I would like to see us work with the Eureka City Schools for the safety and bring it back and um, have a look at it again. You know, when we look at this, the strategic visioning um, was a big piece of why I supported it in the beginning, you know, with the complete streets. And I think that that's really important that we continue to move forward with that. So I was hopeful that we could, uh, again, uh, bring this forward and have some conversations uh, with a better process where people, we've already heard many hours of, of uh, public comment, but with a process where people um, feel heard uh, and transparent about moving forward. So I don't know if anybody would support that, but uh, if you would, I'd appreciate it. 
I want, yeah, please. So yeah, the, the process for bringing something back to a future agenda is to have, I think it's three or more uh, members need to give us a thumbs up. That's okay, all we're looking so. for. <laughs> okay, so. Well, only one thumb, thumb. Yeah. okay. Okay, so just for clarification, um, you know, at least staff's understanding was that, you know, the safety of the children was a concern. There was also a comment made by the superintendent that any one way is not going to be agreeable. So, I mean, staff can commit to looking at, I think the bus stop was one of the main concerns and providing different options for the bus stop um, with the route going the direction that was proposed. Um, staff can't guarantee that we're going to get any feedback from that, but what I'm interpreting is that we do that, we make an attempt to do that, we come back with a recommendation and some options for that bus stop at the next council meeting. Is that what you guys are thinking? That would be fine. I would like us to reach out, like I said, to the Eureka City Schools. You know, I was as I was watching the meeting, you know, I heard Susan Johnson, one of the board members, say, you know, I think that this, this specific idea is not the best, and I would hope we would do not follow through with it, which we didn't, um, and maybe start looking and seeing if there isn't a, something else we could come up with that's better. So it sounds like she's willing to potentially work with us. And also Mike Duncan said something very similar. I think there's, uh, I think there's an option to do what you want to do. I think there's potential to do that. There could be multiple things, but I have not seen or heard any reception or conversation of you guys reaching out to us. So I think it's important so for us to reach out to them. So staff will do that. I, I'm actually going to be attending their meeting on October 6th, and I think that would be the opportunity to bring this up and mm -hmm. provide that information. I think talking to individual board members is very similar to talking to an individual council member. Um, that's not um, really going to be indicative of what the board overall feels. So I think, and Director Germing's probably going to shoot me, that prior to that meeting we'll come up with different options for the bus stop and I will present that to them and get feedback for that and bring it back um, as a part of that council meeting on the 18th. Great, so one moment. So council member Bauer has his hand up. Yeah, I'm just wondering if the 18th isn't too soon. I mean, if we're gonna, if there's gonna be a uh, school board meeting, staff, I mean, is it feasible? I guess the question is for city manager Slattery, is it feasible to develop engineered plans and all that in two weeks, you know, after discussions, which I just don't want to see us go into another meeting and it, and it be, you know, another four hour discussion that if we're not ready with a plan that we, the community, city schools, you know, that we all come to some kind of agreement on. That's, so, that's my thoughts. Uh, I don't want to provide any delusions of grandeur. We're never going to come up with something that everybody's going to agree on. I think we've been pretty clear about that. Um, it won't require um, engineered drawings, but what we would do is very similar to what was presented to council um, as far as conceptual designs. Um, we would do the same for the bus stop, and we'd do the same for the treatments of the bike lanes and how they get over to the right side um, when they leave the Dolbeer, Chester, Hemlock um, couplet there. And so we would be able to do that. And I'm sure Director Gerving is nodding that we could provide those by Thursday's meeting, give them to them and provide a report back and obviously invite them to the 18th meeting to continue to provide comments on that. But I don't want to... Um, lead anyone to believe that we're going to make everybody in agreement on this project. Council Member Castellano. And this may be also a question for City Attorney Luna. I, I mean, I would withdraw my support of bringing this back at the next meeting. Like, like if we're talking about bringing this back at the next meeting, then I don't support. I mean, I don't know if we can. I guess just can I say that? I mean. I don't want to like be discussing the item, but I guess I'm just saying I I don't. Well, I don't think if I my think vote we can is commit to you know if you're saying you don't want to do it if we don't bring it back by the we can definitely bring this back by the 18th. No 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 I don't want to do it if we oh. bring it back on the 18th. So is there any reason that we would have to bring it back by the 18th? 
once again, as we discussed at the meeting previously, we have contractor issues, and if we push this out for too long, we could be outside of their contractual obligations. Um, we also have the issues of the complaints that the area is not striped and hasn't been striped for a long time. So those two things are issues, and um, I don't know, and Director Germing wants to come up and talk about what that time frame is for this, um, the contractor doing the striping, but um, that could become an issue. He's going to come up here. <laughs> Thank you for coming up, Director Gerving. Absolutely, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, so I don't know how many contract days are left in this contract, but we're definitely nearing the end of it. And we would you know, need to negotiate with the contractor, uh, their willingness to hold over if they're willing to entertain that idea. Uh, to completely delay it, but as the city manager indicated, uh, the fact that the striping isn't there has been the subject of a number of complaints. Um, and as sunset grows earlier, and we're going to, you know, at some point uh, here coming up relatively soon near the end of daylight saving time, then that'll be a bigger issue than it is now. So we don't want to wait forever. Uh, we had planned on striping this week and uh, you know, right now we're going to hold off uh, if this is what council wants to do is reconsider the item. So we had four thumbs up. I'm curious, has anybody decided to change their vote? We just need a majority. So if there were... If there were four, okay. even if there was one change, we, I think we can move on. Okay. So is everybody still good or not good? I, it, it's hard to kind of figure out without discussing the item, but I, um, I know Council Member Bauer brought up a willingness to, you know, consider expending the funds to make those roadway changes later, should we come up with a better design, but I, I'm, I'm still happy for it to come back. Okay. Just, there's, I think, a couple of different approaches. <laughs> and maybe we could address both of those. Yeah, we will address both of the issues that we heard. Um, once again, I wanna be clear that, you know, the drop off that we currently have is not I don't believe was going to have support of the board and we will provide two options for the bus stop that was brought up um, and get their feedback on that. Okay. Well, I would like to see it come back for discussion. And if that discussion includes um, putting off the contractor so that we have more time, um, if that, whatever that discussion comes up with, but I would like to see us look at this. I think it's important. Um, is it possible to format this in such a way that if the conversation on Thursday isn't productive, then and you don't feel like there's anything new, then we're not bringing it back? Or do you want to see it come back no matter what? I, I'm just not sure. So, so I don't know what um, would define as anything new. Um, I, I'm sure that if we went there, they would have a yes or no. Um, what do you mean by anything new? I guess my concern is if we put this off for till the 18th and then we're um, incurring expenses or frustration because of that and there's no, I don't know. Autumn, are I you think, clearing your throat because you don't want me yes. to discuss anymore? Well, I think the, the question is, are, are we bringing this item back or not, we've we have had some discussion to kind of sure. to guide, you know, what we bring back, and I think that's fine. But yeah, you know, we don't make decisions on unagendized items, and and I think we need to move on. So okay, I would like to see it brought back for discussion at our next meeting, regardless of what. Well, I guess that discussion and action, just to be clear, for the agenda's sake. Well, and possible action. Possible action. I think that would depend on the contractor. Potentially, portions. Uh, Attorney Luna is saying 
stop talking. Well, I would say, you know, let, let's make it for possible action just just in case that, you know, no harm in making it for possible action. Can, I mean, can we leave it to staff's discretion on when it's brought back? Sure. I'm good with that. I think that makes a lot of sense. Great. So moving on. <laughs> Are we ready to move on? <laughs> we still have our, our majority thumbs up, our majority direction. Okay. okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I have a future agenda oh, yes, item. Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> I'd like, Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to talk about a mechanism to fill sidewalk gaps in the city, especially if we have a, um, you know, a bulk contract where we fix sidewalks. Um, if we could find some mechanism similar to the loan, a loan program, revolving loan program, something like that for people who want to proactively address sidewalk gaps, but don't have a big development project that's going to necessitate that. I'd love to see us discuss that or consider that. And that is at staff's discretion when you could bring that back. <laughs> Scott, do you like it? <laughs> I mean, no pressure. <laughs> Great. Okay, moving on to city manager's reports. Manager Slattery. Thank you, Mayor Pro, Mayor Pro Tem Burgell, and good evening again, Mayor and Council. Um, I was remiss in having a big announcement and thanking Director Millar, Finance Director Millar, for all of his support in the participatory budget process. I'm sure he's sitting with a bottle right now watching this because he's so intrigued with this, but um, Director Millar had a baby boy on Wednesday of this month. Theo Millar was born, so congratulations. Director Millar. Um, the only thing I wanted to bring up was, um, I think we discussed this about the Helen Putnam Award that we were um, awarded as a part of the Cal City's um, Economic Development and Community Services um, uh, Award Program. Um, there's 487 cities. I think they have six Helen Putnam Awards, and the city was awarded one of them. It's the second time since I've been in the city that we've won that award, mm -hmm. and I think of those awards, and I'm biased, of course, we were the most innovative and um, had a lot of feedback from the people that were there um, about our program, um, asked a lot of questions of Larry Alexander, um, our outreach worker that was with us about the program. And I want to announce that Cal Cities is going to be up here for a more formal presentation um, in the next month or two um, with um, our Redwood Empire Division lead, Sarah Sanders. And um, so that'll be coming back to council and we'll, we'll, we'll do some pub for that. But I really want to thank the Uplift crew, um, Caitlin Merrill, um, Project Coordinator Caitlin Merrill, Project Manager Davis, um, Homeless Outreach Workers, um, Larry and Robert, um, uh, Sierra, um, I'm forgetting some people, but um, they do a great job, and I think that um, the expansion of the program into the alternative response that um, our mental health clinician Rosen spoke about today is going to be a real benefit to the city, and I really think that the, the town hall meetings um, that we're going to be coordinating will also help with some of the stigmatisms that have come up from a lot of our public comments, and I'm hoping this will help alleviate um, some of those issues that we've had, so that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. And so now we'll move on to council reports. And let's start with Councilmember Bauer. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just be brief. Uh, I um, was nominated to represent the Redwood Empire Division of uh, the Cal City Board Directors. Woohoo! So, nice job. <laughs> thank you. Um, it's an honor, you know, um, representing cities from essentially, I think, Point Arena uh, all the way to the Oregon border, Crescent City, and inland to Lakeport. So, very cool. And I hope to, you know, represent the city of Eureka and and the whole Redwood Empire Division um, at Cal Cities and make sure that. Our, our community and our our region, our um, our issues are are heard and, and um, championed at the Capitol. So excited about that. Thanks. 
Thank you, Scott. Congratulations. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, Council Member Castellano. Oh, want me to come back to you? Uh, Council Member Moulton. I'm ready, sure. Uh, I don't have any travel to report on, but uh, the South Eureka Neighborhood Alliance did uh, another one of their awesome community events. In this case, it was a, a neighborhood yard sale and a clothing drive and clothing exchange in the park. I just want to express some gratitude to the volunteers at Sina for uh, all of their wonderful efforts getting the community out, getting the folks in the neighborhood out to socialize, but also to help each other. To They're cleaning up parks, we're trading kids clothes, um, we're dancing in the streets, um, and it's all because of them, and I'm grateful for that. I attended Arts Alive, and I just want to say that it was absolutely hopping. There was an adorable baby punk band, not trying, they were just, they, were, they weren't baby. <laughs> They're just like teenagers, but they're punks, and I used to be a punk, and now they're all punk, and it's just super cute. Okay. And tough, and, you know, not trying to be condescending. I'm grateful for the live music is all I'm trying to say. Um, and as well as the Redwood Coast Music Festival all over the city, so many wonderful venues, so many great people coming out. It's just really wonderful to see our community um the, the whole city just blossoming uh, out of the pandemic and out of the ensuing funk. I think people are ready to get out and have some fun again. And that's one of the great things about living on the North Coast is the culture here. And I'm happy to participate in that again. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Arroyo. Well, I am... Um Really excited to have attended the Trail Summit this year. Um, it was a couple weekends ago. And it was, I got to be the MC, which was the fun job. And it was incredible to hear the progress that's happening on some of our trails in the region. Um, and, you know, Hank Seaman provided an update on all these um, projects around the region that are happening. And then uh, Senator McGuire talked about the Great Redwood Trail. Uh, the amount of funding that's been secured for that project and um, just the incredible team of folks moving forward with trail planning um, and implementation. And I, I worked on a lot of trail projects during the years where you could tell that it was going to be cool, but you didn't see a lot getting done. <laughs> a lot of those um, boring but important years, the advocacy years and planning years. And so it's really exciting to me to um, get to see a lot of these things come to life. So um, everyone here probably knows I'm a huge trails advocate and um, it just gave me a, a lot of motivation to keep working on transportation projects. And even when there's just one little piece of the puzzle that happens first, it can create momentum for the rest. So um, that helps me kind of stay focused on the big picture, but also um, really celebrate individual projects. So that was cool. And um, Beyond that, I've been doing kind of my usual meetings and things. Um, I am really excited about the events that have been happening and just the the life that they're breathing into the community. So similar to what others have said, um, I was surprised to hear that folks feel like Old Town is not thriving. Um, perhaps it is not thriving at every hour of every day, but it does seem like people are really out about and enjoying it. Um, and so... I'm just really grateful to see that infusion of um, events kind of bringing people back together and and businesses seeming to do well in the process. So hopefully we can keep that going. I know the winter months can be hard, winter and spring, um, but I'm really excited for all of those efforts to just really bring people to public spaces and use them in a fun and appropriate way and um, just try to try to come back together after COVID. So. I think that's it. Thank you. Council Member Castellano. Thanks for coming back to me. Um, n not too many things. I did uh, attend the HWMA special meeting regarding SB 1383. It was just a study session, so there weren't any actions taken. But I just want to uh, especially appreciate um, Donna Wood and Robin Prasker from the city of Eureka because they're really le um, 
providing a lot of leadership kind of at the staff level for SB 1383 throughout the county. So um, it's just awesome. It, w- it was a shared meeting befo- between the local task force and the board of HWMA. So it was really nice to have um, Eureka strongly represented there. Um, again, I'll definitely inform the council when decisions are made in the f- future. That was just a study session. Um, I, they're not specifically council related. There's some overlap. I did, I traveled to Chico on Friday to represent Humboldt for the California Creative Core program um, to kind of help brainstorm around how some of those resources can come to our region. Um, I've been continuing to facilitate um, kind of an ad hoc housing working group on Mondays. And I just wanted to inform council that one of the things that came up um, is that at that meeting, and I think there'll be more information on this forthcoming, but that the housing authority is, you know, embarking on the repositioning process. And so um, soon, within the next couple of weeks, there's going to be an RFP go out. Um, but they're looking at, you know, basically going from 196 uh, sites to 350 sites, on, you know, within basically the city of Eureka. So it's just kind of, you know, it's, I think, good to know. <laughs> Um, and I believe that will affect our housing element. But anyway, I, I do hope that more information comes for council soon. Um, and then just want to let folks know that the Which Way the Wind Festival is happening over the next kind of week and a half. Lots of kind of speakers and kind of it's definitely a, a festival with an environmental um, framework um, in terms of people's relationships to land and community. So that's all I have. Great. Thank you. And I think that I will be brief as well. Um, I've just been doing a lot of the regular things myself. Um, I really appreciate Council's willingness to bring back this idea um, of the W. Dolbear couplet just because it is, um, you know, with our strategic visioning, I think it's going to be a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, so a couple of things that I did that one day was painful, the other day was not as much, was we did do a cleanup um, out behind HCOE. Um, it was a group of people that came out. It was it was pretty difficult. Um, and uh, it was also really nice to see volunteers out there. You know, I really want to thank Pack Out for coming and picking up the bagged trash. They weren't out doing anything but picking up bagged trash. I want to make sure that we're clear about that. Um, and all the volunteers. And, you know, I also want to just say, and I said it before, I really appreciate the protesters that were there. And I, you know, I would hope that um, they would contact us because I really appreciate the passion of that. And if we could, if we could turn that passion into something in the same direction, I think we could really make a big, huge impact in our city. So if you were one of those protesters, contact me. I'd love to talk to you. Um, and then the other one, uh, we just had a cleanup again at Pack Out Green Team. Um, down at uh, right behind Walmart and I just wanted to bring that up to let you know that um, I love our community and I love our trail stewards they work so hard all the time to manage what is happening on our trails on a regular basis and so we finished the pack out green team cleanup and a volunteer uh, extraordinaire Stan Wong Stan Wong if you're out there rock star this guy rock star he found a camp just awful and um it wasn't really a camp it was just a bunch of garbage and he stayed after to clean up that thing it was six and a half loads uh to take it to the dumpster but you know that's that's the community i live in is that people are willing to put in the effort when it's necessary and i really appreciate that on so many levels with so many different people in so many different ways so grateful for our city and our region and with that we're adjourned happy tuesday night We're early, too.